Welcome to the uh, Phoenix Comic Con. This is going to be the nuts and bolts of the world building. And uh, we've got Michael Sackville, Dean Laurie, James Owen, and Sam Sykes. And uh, let's see. I guess we can start with. Service or he'll tase you. Okay, well, I'm going to a discussion about tasing, so everything's going to wind up ending with, or Sam will tase you. Um, could you go ahead and let us uh, tell us a little bit about your book? Sure, sure. Uh, I wrote these two behemoths, Tome of the Undergates and Black Halo. Uh, they are, I've been criticized about how light it is on world building, and to be honest, when I'm on these sort of panels, I sort of just make it a point to disagree with everyone. Because I do love world building as much as everyone else, but I find that a lot of people focus a lot on world building, thinking that the world building is going to drive the story, which is a pretty fallacious notion. It's always character that drives everything else. And so I'm going to be completely obnoxious during this whole thing. I might even get your fate. <laughs> no, you can't taste me. It'll be funny. I fully approve of this. Okay. I'm uh, <coughs> James Owen. My main series, most people know me for, is called The Chronicles of the Imaginary Geographica that I write and illustrate. And I actually just. Uh, finished the revisions of the sixth book in the series yesterday, which is why I didn't get in here until just a couple of hours ago, and uh, working on the seventh one, and also uh, about to release a ebook series of novels called Myth World, which is a series of books that I wrote for a German publisher several year years ago, so I'm probably going to talk about that aspect of world building uh, with those books, because that was my first experience at writing a whole series of novels, and it was my first experience in prose. And so it's kind of learning, you know, while you're in the deep end of the pool, realizing you're in the deep end of the pool and you've never swum before. So that, that's probably going to be my focus on it. Uh, my name is Dean Lorry. I write the Nightmare Academy uh, series, which is a middle grade series uh, for kids, you know, 9 to <coughs> 14. Um, I come to novel writing kind of recently. Um, I'm Kind of the world of uh, TV and movies, um, where there wasn't a ton of world building there, so uh, it was a, a little bit of a new uh, a new skill for me. So I'm eager to uh, let's talk about it. Uh, I'm Mike Stackpole, and uh, let's see. I think this is something on the order of my 40th novel. Um, I have done world building um, in uh, well, in, in started in my career doing role playing games, so I did a lot of world building within the gaming industry. Um, and then I, I built uh, um, uh, I built my own universes for uh, for a variety of uh, fantasy novels. I've also worked inside uh, universes like Star Wars and Battletech, and, and had a certain amount of influence building infrastructure there. Um, and while I would agree with Sam that uh, writers concentrate on world building um, instead of looking at characters uh, make a grave error. Um, it's also really important to remember that one of the things that most readers come to fiction for is that is being a tourist, is being able to explore a world and figure out how it works, and this is what entertains a great deal of uh, a great deal of them. And sometimes when the characters don't work in a story, all you get is world building. Uh, so it, it is it, it is an aspect of stories that I think you have to pay attention to, um, but characters are going to be more important, and especially making sure that the characters fit within the world and are born out of the world, uh, and can't just be be popped out like a, you know ejected out of a uh, out of a cockpit of a failing jet. <laughs> You can tell right there? <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't listen. <laughs> it's a tasing offense, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll get to it. Eventually it'll go on. I mean, just said. So about five minutes from now, I'm going to be greatly offended. I like reading Sam's books. Every time I finish, I feel like going into a grocery store and assaulting people. <laughs> 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 be blamed for what people do. But you don't use the pro 
produce in the cans. Well, use no. the fresh stuff. You gotta use the fresh stuff because otherwise. No, that's actually you know that's that's a real good point. Um, even though I'm just giving them a hard time, but the world building works when you feel you're completely immersed in that world, and that's something I, I've actually really enjoyed about the books that Sam writes. If you get completely into it, um, if the world building worked out that way, um, a lot of times it doesn't. But that's when it hasn't really worked. Uh, it doesn't have to be about the world building, but if you haven't done it properly, people aren't going to be wrapped up in the story. They're not going to be wrapped up in what's going on with the characters. You're not going to feel like it's a real place. I, I can't confuse Sam's world with somebody else's. You, you pick it up and you start reading it and you're already there. And that's a function of the story he's telling and the characters and uh, to some degree even the language. I think it all, all plays a part in, in how you shape those worlds you write about. Totally. Um, what I think the role of characters is it's you know it's all kind of two pronged. The characters will draw you in. The world is going to keep you interested, but the characters are what's going to keep you invested in the world. The world without the characters is just a lot of scenery that you may or may not have the ability to paint to the best of your to your readers' uh, admiration. So. <laughs> Character, you know, characters have to be there to pull people in and to invest them in because, because it's the characters that we are going to be with. But they do build the world around them. And half the fun of world building is seeing how everyone else, how all these characters relate to the world around them. Because otherwise it is just scenery. So, basically, the rule for world building that I've always used and it's always served me well is the Chekhov's gun principle, which is don't mention anything that you're not going to use. If you describe a gun on the wall at some point, you have to shoot it. And the same goes with world building. If you have these vast ancient language that you've spent, you know, 20 years creating finding down to an alphabet, and it doesn't play a role in the story, well, there's no reason for it to be there. And the same goes with everything else you've created, all the history, all the lore. If it doesn't affect the characters in some way, it's absolutely pointless because we're not invested in it. But if you but save it in files, your son can publish it as a series of books <laughs> after that. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the, here's, the, here's the real important thing. Two, two comments about that. The real important thing is this, is that that judgment of whether or not it fits into the story is a judgment that you make as you're revising the story. Mm. Sometimes you will go ahead and you will toss in little comments, little sidebars, little color comments. Two characters might make reference to the battle of such and such that happened ten years ago, uh, merely because it would be it would be proper since one is a veteran that they would make a reference yeah. to that. That's that's throwaway color. But as you're revising the novel, you'll often find that that's a touchstone that you can pick up, and then you build it in. So what Sam is saying is absolutely right. You don't put anything in, especially as an absolute, unless you have a use for it. But that is a judgment that you come to in the revision process. When you're writing, don't sweat that stuff. You can change it and fix it later. The other thing that I, I, I want to point out, because you're, you're, you're hinting at it, um, and it's, it's really the secret of good world building, as opposed to bad world building, um, is this consequence. Actions have to have consequences. Bad worlds, and we have all read plenty of novels where they're bad worlds, are worlds that exist in a 25 foot radius circle around the main characters. That's the only place the world exists. If they go through a town, and they murder a bunch of people to get information and then act on that information and go away and come back, nobody in that town will notice that they've murdered those people. Whereas a good world where there is consequence, someone will notice, someone will come after them, someone will be seeking revenge. It becomes a real world. You have to do that sort of stuff. And it's not very difficult. All you do is say, if they do this, what will happen? And you make a note, 
and you decide five or six chapters <coughs> down the line, or two or three stories down the line, that you are going to have to play with that particular consequence. All right? And again, it's not a process of doing it right then. And again, I, one of the things that drives me nuts about some authors, and it goes back to the whole Chekhov gun thing, um, you know, because it's if you show the gun, you know, then you better use it immediately. Yeah. Um, no, you can stretch it out. And remember, it gets better if you stretch it out, because the reader goes, oh yeah, I remember that. Gosh, I was fooled. Yes, of course you were, because we, the writers, know what we're doing. We meant to fool you, okay? You'll feel bad, you'll feel we're brilliant. This is what we want. <laughs> and you will keep buying our stuff to find what other little shoes that we're going to let drop as we go along. But, but as you're looking at your world and as you're looking at putting things together, just remember, make the world real in that sense. Have consequences and make sure that these things do connect up because that's really how you develop the richness and the depth of your world. It sort of feeds into itself, doesn't it? The consequence, you know, to use your example, people come in and they murder some people for information. And if these are the protagonists, you know, maybe they had a good reason to murder the guy for information. You know, maybe something went bad. Uh, and they just go on. Whoever comes and finds that guy and wants revenge, we're invested in his story now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's not just swearing revenge like, oh, I don't like these two guys. He's swearing revenge, oh, God, they killed my brother. Was it a dick move? <laughs> uh, and that, and instantly we have another character with his own motivation, and the consequences feed into that, and what he does now affects the protagonists, and the world is that much richer because of the people involved. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, guess, I guess that would have to you know, be a sign, maybe after the fact, that you were successful at the initial act of world building, is that you can have the consequences to, to something, and that shapes the nature of the stories that you tell after that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, with Here There Be Dragons, I had an incident happen with a tower called the Keep of Time that's now resonated through the rest of the books and it's changed the shape of the rest of the stories. I've gone so far off the original plans for some of these books, uh, but that's okay because I've kept most of the original story elements. It's the characters responding to what happened and then having to continue deal with, dealing with that. And um, also meant I got some more books out of it. Um, <laughs> Always useful. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, more, more income. That's why I write series. It's, it's job security. Um, you never tell an editor that you got one idea for a book. And you, you tell them, you've got, oh, I got 15 novels. Um, <laughs> because if you really want to do this for a living, eventually you'll figure out how to fill 15 novels. Um, but that, that was the fun thing about it, is realizing I had some storylines I hadn't planned on that I wanted to pursue based on what happened in this initial book. Um, there was a throwaway character in this first one. I, I had my characters come to a, an island in this imaginary archipelago. And I wanted to show right off the bat this isn't a normal world, so I had somebody pick them up in a steam-powered car, and it had to be a talking animal. So I picked a badger because I wanted to draw a badger. <laughs> Everybody liked the badger. I had this weird little speaking pattern that he had, and all the kids would emulate this. I thought, well, that's, that's fun. So I had him stick around for the next book. By the time we got to book three, it's gone from one little badger driving a car to 20 of them on a fire engine. <laughs> Everybody dug the badgers. And uh, then we did the audiobooks. And it's a Scottish actor that reads them. And so now I've got these badgers that talk with a Scottish accent. <laughs> so now you go to grade schools and you've got third graders all talking as badgers with a Scottish accent. <laughs> all because I had this one character I wanted to put in there. And it's turned into this whole thing. And um, that wasn't something that could be planned, but it was something that was organic. That could happen because I created the setting for that to take place. Yeah, it's fun when the, 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 you know, worlds take shape and begin to click as you discover what's fun for you about the writing of the thing, you know, and um, the other thing is, you know, novels have the benefit of time. Um, you know, readers read a book and, you know, the amount of time it takes them to read something and, and sort of like, you know, you were saying, it, it's much easier to surprise people because, you know, we've got months, years sometimes to, you know, to plot it out and lay it out, and, you know, 
um, and, and sort of lay our traps uh, for the readers. So, you know, a lot of times I find that the, the world sort of creates itself around the ideas that you get jazzed about as you write. You know, you start by, you know, figuring out the layout of the world and all of that, enough to just at least, you know, uh, dive off the diving board and get into it a little bit. But then, you know, as you, as you start writing and you start finding out, like, what clicks for you, what's fun for you, um, you know, I find that I just start gravitating towards that, and that's what I tend to, to want to flesh out a little bit as I, as I move forward. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. In, in um, this the book I did, I mean, Here Are Years I'm Dead, it's a superhero noir novel. And uh, uh, and it's it's digital only, and I've got it on on CD. But there was a there was a scene that was inspired by the last time I was at San Diego Comic Con, and, and you'll be able to see this down on the floor. Um, there was uh, uh, there were uh, media outlets. Heroes was a big TV show last time I was at San Diego Comic Con, and there were lines and lines and lines of people to pick up whatever tchotchke they were handing out there, right? And then over in this area over here were comic book creators from the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, and nobody was there talking to them. No one was getting sketches, you know. And 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 in the superhero noir novel, um, I've got a, a there's a character being inducted into the superhero hall of fame, and 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 surrounding this whole hoopla, there are two tents, and over here there are people getting autographs and big signs and, and long lines. And these are all the actors who played the old superheroes in television shows. Over in this tent are the old superheroes, and it was, and, and, and that was, funny. and that was, and that was, and because I had seen that in San Diego, that was what inspired me. Well, one of these old superheroes was a guy named Puma, and I knew I just needed an old superhero who would die tragically during the ceremony. Okay, and that's all I ever intended. But as I started writing the scene where we ran into Puma, all, all of a sudden this character just spread himself throughout this book. I mean, as intended, he dies right there, but his influence through flashbacks and stuff that, that he had left after he died, he left letters for people, and all of these other things, suddenly he became a central character in this novel who I had never considered even adding into the book except for that little thing that I saw at San Diego. And, and, and as you were saying, you know, this is when you discover the things that are fun for you in the book. This is how you, the author, get surprised by this book. Because you have these little characters that take on a life of their own, and suddenly you've got far more influence. I mean, you know, I've done this novel about all the other characters, and whenever I think about short stories, it's like, oh, it'd be fun to do a Puma short story, you know. And, and uh, you know, so, it's, so again, the throwaway character suddenly takes on this big life, and you build the world in a way that you can accommodate these characters. And they are so strong because they've, they've grown out of the world that you created. Therefore, they're a perfect match for that particular world. Sometimes even better than the main characters that you brought in and you thought you were writing about. Yeah. To bring it all together, because we're making some good points here, it has to be fun for you to write. If it's like, I just, when you mentioned the keep of time, I instantly thought of that scene in which it is a giant tower which time is pretty much held in this tower and it gets destroyed and afterwards I'm like, hmm, that might be a problem later. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, onward. Um, and I could tell, you know, James had a lot of fun writing that. Same with, you know, the Badgers. And they're worth, it's worth reading just for the Badger. <laughs> I don't, I don't think of him as a throwaway. I think he made the book. <laughs> but this does remind me of some authors who, and I mentioned this before, a lot of authors who feel they have to do a lot of world building and they have to do, you know, they have to flesh out all these histories in great details and they have to have as many appendices as, as Lord of the Rings does. If it's not fun, you don't have to do it. Well, you should be at least a little interested because if you're not interested in it and you're still writing it, the reader is going to read it and they are not going to be interested. So, so the unspoken question there that really is, and I give this a lot, how much research or how much world building is too much? And the answer is this, when you are doing the research or doing the world building, as an excuse not to write, it's too much. Stop. Write. One of the things that you will find, it is okay. Remember, you're going to be at minimum, at minimum, you'll have five shots at getting the book right. 
Okay? Your first draft, you will automatically do a second draft just to correct little things. If you send that second draft off, uh, an editor will send it back and will want revisions of this draft three. Copy editor will send it back to you. There's draft four. And then you get the galleys. You get that last minute double check. So that's your fifth shot at getting this book right. There is no sin in, as you're writing the book, saying, just living, you know, putting in parentheses, insert how steam-powered car works here. Okay? <laughs> you can do that. Just keep writing. When you, you know, when you tire or when you are done for the day, then you go ahead and see how that steam-powered car might work because that might inspire a few more ideas that you can play with later. But you can do that. And you can go through and retrofit things. Like I say, I'm just finishing up the sequel to this novel, and I've discovered in the last third of the novel certain things which are really making the novel tie up really tightly, and I'm really, really happy. And as I go through and do my second draft, I've got to pull those threads from the end of the book and string them back through the beginning of the book. And just so you know, the end of the book will tell you where the book begins. All right? Where you get to at the end may tell you that you need a couple extra chapters up front, or may tell you your book actually begins at chapter 6, and so everything before it you could throw away. All right? These things happen. But once you get through that novel, you'll have learned a lot about the world, you'll have found these cool little things, you'll have found these characters that you want to emphasize, and you'll be able to draw them back in. And that is part of the creative process, and that is what makes it so much fun. Because you look at what you thought you were going to do, and then you look at what, you, what turns out, and what turns out is always more magical. Just because of the way that it's, it's built up momentum, and you've gotten to know the characters, and they take on lives of their own.